Well, thank you for joining me again this evening. On the last of three last evenings, we're going to have to look at Pauline's story. Today's story will highlight a number of little practical things that maybe we can find helpful for our own life stories. But I think underlying all of this will be a sort of a challenge. I would feel that this story would have been a, a total waste if you and I have not been able to see where it presses into our own hearts. It's so easy in our Western and often comfortable world to become so accustomed to having everything we need. We suspect that we can provide and we become so independent. I don't know if you ever notice how, I mean, the old days of a cup of sugar from your neighbour are long since gone. But there is such a, a wonderful, wonderful blessing when Christians seek to bless each other uh, from one to the other. And it doesn't have to be in big ways. But if we're not doing it at all, then I suspect we've missed a massive part of the New Testament, which relates to what we call one another passages. Bear one another's burdens. Pray for one another. Forgive one another. And of course, there are many other practical ways we can help one another. It's interesting that in this, by this chapter we're on today, we'll see how God does that in the life of Pauline. And I hope that you'll find it a real inspiration to move out of maybe the places where you feel safe and take much more steps of faith in prayer. Asking God, show me whom I can bless. Or Lord, you know the needs I have in my life. Maybe not material needs, but needs for fellowship and friendship and encouragement. Lord, pour these into my life. And let's just go with the story. Oh, I was so angry. I was rebellious that I could so angry, so angry and rebellious that I couldn't even pray. The mission leadership had directed that I should take early retirement. I should be off the field, the mission field, by the following summer. Why? Why? Why now, two years later, when I'm so much better and able to carry on a full program? It just, it, it just isn't fair. Besides, where would I live in the United States? How would I be able to meet their high costs of medical expenses? Because I'm under the greatest of care here in Taiwan. Wonderful medical care, good doctors. And I just hate it if I would admit it. I hated the unknown. I was amazed and horrified at my reactions to my lack of faith. So different from my reaction to the point whenever I was told that I had cancer and I had such peace then. How could I accept that news and not this news? Had I forgotten God's faithfulness to me down through the years? And even though I lectured myself and talked to myself, it somehow did not calm my heart. I wouldn't share this news with any other people, either Chinese or Westerners. I was going to fight this out on my own. After a week of misery, I heard the Lord's voice to me, and it came through the words of Isaiah 54, 10 and 11, which said, The mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony and lay your foundations with sapphires. In righteousness you shall be established. This was a timely reminder to me that though everything be changed, God was still there. He understands my needs and he can be trusted to prepare the right place for me and when I began to embrace this and, and listen to it, peace and calm began to return to my heart. And I knew that if it weren't his will that I retire, he could easily change the whole picture. So, as life began to return to normal, I felt it wise just to keep my retirement threat under my hat. For there were lots of opportunities to continue to serve and people's hearts were open. So on my birthday, the end of January 1978, I got up early for non-interrupted time with the Lord. 
I knew that after 10 o'clock people would call. It was normal and natural for them want to be there. And in the afternoon, I had 35 or 40 women coming and they were going to have a potluck supper and they were going to stay and make Chinese dumplings. And again that day, in my quiet time, set apart that special moment, the Lord spoke to me from Psalm 139. And I'll read it to you again. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's funny, although I knew these passages and I had taught these truths to other people, on that day they came to me with a very particular freshness and a whole new light. It was going to be hard to leave Asia. Now, 63 years old, I had spent half of my life in letting the Lord use me for his purpose among the Chinese. I had not one regret in spending 31 and a half years in mainland China and Taiwan. No, my heaviness of heart was at the thought of leaving behind all these things that had become so familiar to me now. This was my life. These people were as dear to me as a family. And yet what I had given up for God, or given up to God, he had restored and returned to me more than 100 fold. So by early March, my heart was settled enough for me to be able to share this matter with all my fellow workers, Chinese missionaries, and so forth. And I knew that I had to start to wind down all my, all my affairs if I was going to be gone before the summer. I really wanted to get away as quietly as possible because there is a stress in the departing and farewells. But the love that Chinese friends began to shower upon me was just so overwhelming. Oh, they began to give me gifts. And knowing that I was going to have to travel all the way back to America, they didn't give me big gifts, but they gave me really expensive gifts. Lots of jewellery, including pearls and opals and agate and ruby and coral. And there were gifts of gold, much of it that yellow gold, which is accompanied by little certificates so that it can be told the weight and the quality of the gold that I can then use to translate into money in America. And I think as I pondered about all of this, these generous gifts coming to me, it was as though God was saying to me, look, you will be all right in America. You can be resting in me. And at the farewell church service at Grace Church in Taichung, the congregation which I've been associated with now for 27 years, presented me with this lovely plaque inscribed with the words, and can you guess, without them knowing anything, Isaiah 54 verse 10. Wow, no way they could have known how much, how much that verse was going to mean to me. They gave me also a very generous gift of a thousand American dollars, which was a tremendous amount of money and that they said that this could go towards helping me to furnish my apartment when I got to America. The days were passing rapidly and I had other things to do. I needed to sell my little Datsun car, 98,000 miles on it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll get, you know, $300 for it. But the man who did my servicing, he said, if you ever want to sell this car, you come back to me. So I duly went back to him and I said, uh, because I had no idea what it was worth and he asked me what you want and I said look whatever you think So instead of giving me 300 American dollars, he said well What about 48,000 Taiwan dollars, which was the equivalent of 1200 American dollars and then because I hesitated out of surprise Totally out of surprise. He then said well, okay. Well, we can add another what about 60,000? So we added another 300 American dollars on that But can you believe it? Yeah Surely the Lord meant this is a good start in the provision of a car when I would get to America as well. And then, for years, I had been praying for a person who owed me a considerable sum of money. When I was studying back in America 20 years earlier, he had a real need because of a medical situation, and I had given him a, a large amount of money, and he had paid me half of the money and said, oh, I, I will get the other to you. Well, 15 years later, He's now working in Taiwan in a very, very good position in Taiwan. But he never came to see me. And every time I met him, he was 
it's always awkward and it seemed as though he was in a hurry and, and, and I just felt a bit strange. So I began to pray, Lord, um, if I'm going to retire, would you bring this man back to a close relationship with yourself? Because that was my first and primary concern for this man. But as proof of this, would you make him repay the debt? I like her way of praying. Nothing happened except that now when I met him, he seemed even more uncom uncomfortable than before. <laughs> then, just two days before I was to say my last farewells, I had a telephone call and he said, Grandma, did I ever pay you back the money I owe you? Ah, quite astonished to hear from him at this late date. I replied, well, no, actually you didn't. Are you sure? Yes, yes, no, I'm sure. Why don't you come over and we have a chat? I'll be right over. And he answered, and very shortly he was at the door. And as we sat and talked, he remembered what had happened, and he handed me the equivalent of 700 US dollars. The best part, of course, was the fellowship that we now could have in the Lord. But that's not the end of the surprises. On my last day in Taiwan, God really does push things to the very limit. A young couple invited me out to dinner in Taipei. After dinner, this young man, who was one of the original boys in the Hope of China class, you remember my Bible class for the boys from the delinquent school and so forth, he got up from the table and he stood behind, beside me and he said, Grandma, I'm going to be at the airport tomorrow to see you off, but I just wanted to say goodbye now. And then he shook my hands and in doing so, he left a big wad of bills. Hmm. I glanced at them quickly, assuming they were local currency. Then I realized, no, these are American. I looked again, a very on Chinese thing to do. And I saw in my hand five American $100 bills. Oh, but you can't afford to do this, I said. I cannot afford not to do it, he said. Anyway, you're going to need wheels when you get to America. Maybe this will buy one of your wheels. Well, how do you react to such generosity? Ironically, my flying date was American Independence Day, July the 4th, 1978. And rather than gaining my independence, I felt I was entering into a whole new world of dependence upon the Lord. Now you see what I mean when I was saying at the beginning about the, just the, the joy and the blessing of resting in God, of seeking God, and of being used by God. I think of all of those people who were generous to Pauline, how they, they had a part in a great story. And God had obviously blessed them, and now they were able to bless others. And of course, isn't that what he says? He blesses us that we may bless others. And I hope that you and I, we will all just continue to just rejoice in this and find a whole new liberty in our hearts in this whole area of giving to God and giving to others and sharing upon them the goodness and the mercy that God has shared upon us. So let's meet again tomorrow night. And let me remind you also, of course, if you want to be part of the Cory Ten Boon hiding place narrative that we're going to get into next week, you need to let us know, if you haven't already done so, that is, if you're getting this reminder every day, you obviously will get it. But if you have friends or others, you say, I'd love them to hear it, then you really need to sort of get us connected and that will be the way to do it. And I was also thinking this thought as I was pondering with now all of us who've been involved in this, there's about 200, a little over 200 of us every evening get together to go through this. And I thought because OMF have been so generous to us, they have given us the freedom to use this. Uh, and so literally they've given us all a book. I thought if, if any of us would like to make a little gift to OMF to say thank you, it would be a way in which we could bless OMF. And I'm sure mission organizations are finding these days very hard. Um, we could we could set aside a little gift and either at the end of all this lockdown we could bring it and identify it's for OMF or you could send it in to uh, our office or through our normal account and just indicate this is for the OMF because I'd really love to bless them because if, if ever I've been blessed it's through refreshing readings of things like this they have so so helped me in my life and I hope they continue to help you as well so thanks again and God bless you